We live in an age where everything anyone wants to know about virtually anything is available by peering into the all-consuming blue-green glow of technology. Circumcision is the surgical removal. I've always been excellent anti-personal weaponry for two weeks. <laughs> you country cars, you country cars. Decisions, purchases, plans, relationships. They're all made utilizing computers and smartphones as the intermediary. Even when we are together, we're separated by gigabytes and bandwidth. Meanwhile, an ever-hungrier audience gazes slack-jawed and unblinking into a maelstrom of pixels that has created a cloud-based buffer between human beings. Revolution, invasion, whatever you call it, this new clear proliferation of technology has been no more disruptive than right here. In the arena built upon interpersonal interactions that occur within gatherings of like-minded individuals. Like it or not, the last bastion of face-to-face -face marketing is being transformed by face-to-screen experiences. The quest to create ever more memorable experiences has resulted in an arms race of bigger, bolder, and more titillating that might excite the senses, but leave attendees less empowered, less enriched. In the end though, creating a big flashy spectacle might be really cool, but that is not the only reason we hold and attend conventions and trade shows. The goal is to inform and educate, not just to entertain, to teach our peers what is new what is interesting, what is empowering. And so, as we deploy powerful and sensational technology, as we race headlong into the future, it is important to remember why we are all here. Yes, trade show attendees have become less patient with crowds and weights. Yes, their attention spans have been digitally conditioned to be shorter than ever before. And yes, the demand for entertainment and instant gratification among our core audiences has reached an all-time high. But none of that trumps the real reason why they come. Bringing people together, physically, emotionally, intellectually, that's the point. Not just to distract and disorient, but to create memorable experiences that ultimately result in quantifiable actions. This requires the type of engagement that goes beyond the flashy use of technology. It's layering the technology available to us with a clear purpose. To do that, we need to understand how people learn, how they gather information, what makes them filter out information, and what ultimately takes a particular experience and transforms it from the temporal to a galvanized, actionable memory. There's something that happens when sound uh, is reinforced by other senses that uh, helps memory. Dr. Colby Later 
Associate Professor and Program Director, Music Engineering and Technology at the University of Miami, explains how our senses are the gateway to memory and how tapping into a specific sense, our audience's hearing, can make presentations more engaging, more memorable, and ultimately more effective. Sound is closest to the motor cortex, the, the auditory cortex in the brain. I don't mean to get all into, into to neurology, but it's very close to, uh, to rhythm and dancing. Sound needs to be clear. Sound needs to be direct and clear, uh, especially in a corporate environment. Uh, if I'm writing a, a piece as a composer, I can maybe compose some ambiguity. But I, we know from research that the number two biggest complaint at conferences in general around the world, independent of your discipline, it can be medical conferences, they can be hospitality conferences, they can be anything, the number two biggest complaint is lack of quality sound. And especially in a retail or corporate environment, Lack of clarity, lack of intelligibility can be a killer, can be a buzzkill. It can be the best conference you've ever been to. But if you can't understand what's going on, what the speaker is saying, or if you can't have a conversation with the person standing right next to you, nose to nose, which we've all experienced at, at restaurants and other events, uh, that can be a complete killer for the entire conference. A piece that one of my uh, students who uh, uh, spent Thanksgiving back home with his family in, in, uh, in Puerto Rico and there's this amazing uh, uh, animal there called a coqui and it makes this sound. It sounds literally like the word coqui which is an onomatopoeia just like sizzle, bacon sizzles. That's the sound bacon makes. Um, his two-minute piece transported us from the rainforest near his house out to a party. So in this two-minute narrative, purely of sound, we all closed our eyes and listened to it, we were transported to Puerto Rico. Most of us in the class had never been there. And we were transported from the rainforest hearing this to this impromptu party. And uh, it was amazing. Part of the elegance of sound and, and, and music and, and all these experiences being tied together is that in a very elegant, abstract way, in a very profound way, they allow us to construct our own narrative. 
but there's something inherent and elegant and beautiful about just the, the, the isolation of the sound and the way it impacts our brains that can transport us. So when we hear a certain sound, I know that my mother, whenever she will hear the opening chord of Hard Day's Night, <laughs> as any child of the 1960s growing up, and my mom was one of those girls in the, you know, in the front crowd screaming for George, Paul, Ringo, and John, um, whenever you can just play that chord and she immediately is transported back to being 13 years old, seeing uh, uh, the Fab Four. It, it, is tied so profoundly, and it, it just takes that one chord. In fact, I could cut a tenth of a second of that chord, and it would transport her back to that place. Engaging all of the senses, but focusing on sound, is just one piece of the puzzle. Developing a narrative, a compelling story, is another. Let's get the pump started. Three proline, double forehand, second stitch backhand, please. Let's make sure our patient makes it. I think it's important that there must be a constant switch in, I would say, um, content and impressions and audio and visuals to keep the people connected to the teaching product. You know, if you look at the way a movie plot is made, uh, there are very important key parts to the movie that make it successful or not. And uh, that's basically what we're doing too. It's, it's storytelling, nothing else. How's the blood pressure? 180 over 120. Wow. Is that your usual blood pressure or you're just happy to see Nurse Linda? Too high, right? <laughs> Hi. Dr. Thomas Binder, director of the Echocardiography Laboratory of the University Clinic of Cardiology in Vienna, Austria, talks us through this concept. If you don't capture the people within seconds or minutes, they're gone. So you have to kind of provide content in a different format so it really captures them. And I think one of the most important things is that you use um, content that kind of emotionalizes. Uh, in other words, where the people can somehow um, hook their own experience or their emotions uh, to the educational material. And there's lots of research out there that documents that you can remember stuff much better if you have some kind of an emotional, uh, let's say, setting in which you're learning. And look what we have here. Another healthy heart. How's Alice doing on her surgical rotation, Bob? Uh, Mississippi Riverboat. She makes three knots per hour. <laughs> uh, what we do here is we have um, a storyline, which is a true case, um, also with a lot of facts, uh, which but emotionalize the content, and then we reenact the case, and uh, we include, you know, medical uh, decision making into this movie, where you see the discussions between the doctors, where you uh, see what is actually happening, where you see imaging material, uh, but you also see the emotional part, not only of the patient, but also of the doctors, you know, the world of doctors. There are plenty of oral alternatives. You mean the NOACs? Yeah. Yeah, this would be brilliant if they were approved. The realigned study was terminated prematurely. If you look at research that is being performed, uh, where they ask people how much of a lecture they remember, you would see that a very low percentage is actually still in the memory of uh, the viewer once he leaves the auditorium. And if you go ask them again after a certain, certain time, uh, the percentage will drop and drop and drop. So in essence, when people go to lectures, they don't remember what is really being taught there. And what I think must be done is we must emotionalize the content in such a form that at the end of the day it really sticks because that is the true value of education. We need to educate the people in such a way that we're not wasting their time. Wrapping your message in a compelling story, making it more memorable by emotionalizing the content, that's the form. You must now decide where you will present it. Your options are nearly limitless, and this speaks to the function. This is Hyperfair, a completely virtual convention center. I'm here to meet Martina Ori, who is the marketing and program director here. I, I think that's her over there. Yeah, that's her. Let's go see if we can talk to her. Hello? Oh. Hi. Hi, um, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. Uh, where are we? So, this is uh, an example of a 3D 
immersive virtual environments for events, conventions, and learning.、Um, Hyperfair is a, the only company in the world for virtual trade shows for virtual events. That allow an unlimited number of people to be online at the same time, and here we can interact through our avatar as as if we were in the same place in person, in in this 3D game-like environment.、Uh, where are you physically? Where do you actually? Where where are you on the planet? <laughs> I am located in San Francisco. So I'm in Miami, and this is almost the perfect demonstration of the power of this program. What are some of the advantages of the virtual trade show? Sure. So、um, people can walk around in a lifelike environment. They can talk as we're doing. They can chat, and you can really know a lot of things about what people do in in your booth because you will be able to see、uh, who has viewed your brochure, for example, who has、uh, downloaded it to their computer. Or also, who has added this to your bag, which is very important information for an exhibitor. It seems to me, though, that there's actually three audiences that collect data. There's the host organization, whoever is putting on the、uh, the trade show or convention,、uh, the exhibitors, and then、uh, folks like me who might be walking around. Can you talk about how powerful that data is for each? Yeah, sure. So as for organizers. They will be able to see to get an overview, also comparatively, of what happens in their environment. So they will be able to know, for example, the most visited booths, the most active users,、uh, uh, both attendees, exhibitors, sponsors, the shares on social media, and a lot of information about what everything that happens in their in their environment. For sponsors, this is as I was telling you before. It's、uh, very powerful because you will be able to know who look looks at your banner, who clicks on the banner, and it's it's not just、uh, based on the assumption or on the hope that people would just pass by, but they you will be able really to know the exact name and number of who passed by and looked、uh, at your banner. And the same goes for exhibitors who can access. Real-time analytics from within their booth, and as an attendee, you have the opportunity to obviously download all the、uh, all the chat conversations that you have, all the contacts, both as a CSV file as a PDF, as well as to make very de- very focused search. So, do you see? I mean, right now you talk about a hybrid event, but do you see this as in the future competition to a geographically based trade show? No, I don't think so. I don't actually think this is the case because the two things, the physical and the virtual, can complement each other very well. I think that, for example,、um, virtual events really provide, with the hyperfair, for example, provide really great analytics because they are avatar-based. So the avatar becomes the proxy of the person, and this means that we can track everything that happens in the platform. So I really see that as an opportunity for organizers to offer more to their exhibitors and sponsors, and also to generate additional revenue. It's a, it's an additional revenue stream for them, and I think the the two things do not compete with, with each other, but they really complement and benefit each other. The virtual world complementing the real world. Utilizing technology to its fullest, but how close can those two worlds get? Many people have approached this by trying to make the look and feel of the virtual world more real. But what if we could bring the real-world data collection capabilities closer to that of the virtual world? So, Joel, what does this mean for us here in the real world? One of the most amazing things is that we're no longer limited to the virtual space. We can take all this data and map it onto a computational model and take a look at what's happening in real life, in real time. Now, all this data that's been collected are coming into systems like these for analysis. We no longer have to rely on what we're making up. We're able to take a look at reality and figure out answers from there.
Joel Zisman, the director of high performance computing for the University of Miami's Center for Computational Science, tells us about big data, what can be collected, and how it can be used. Well, welcome, first of all, to the University of Miami Center for Computational Science. The NAP here is home to the Pegasus Supercomputer, which is currently the biggest piece of system that we're working with at the University of Miami. What does it do? Well, it does everything. It's virtually a Swiss Army knife of computers. If you look over to the sides here, we have our computational suite right here. This is actually where all the processing takes place. On this side over here, we have all our storage. Now our storage, although most people don't think it's a very important part, actually is an integral part of our entire environment. We have roughly about eight petabytes worth of storage here that gets used on a daily basis. This is an archive that sits around. This is real data that is processed and utilized every day. And we have about 6,000 compute cores over on this side that's doing the actual processing. How deep can that data go? Can it tell whether I'm happy? Well, we're trying to figure that out right now. The only thing problem that we have is the physical interaction of human beings and computers. We usually require some sort of input, whether it's a keyboard, a mouse, an iPhone, but we can also take a look at pupil dilation, skin flushing, we can take a look at people breathe fast. All these will be triggers for emotions for us to take a look at. Wow, that's way too intimate for me, man. I don't know if I want you to know. The funny part is, take a look at what you have on Amazon, on Facebook. You might be surprised how much of your own information is already out there. All right, so I've got a building full of people. They're all moving in different directions. You got it. Looking at different stuff. Yep. It's a trade show or a convention. There's a billion different things going on. There's a million different impressions. How can you help me, Joel? The first thing we have to find out is, is it a great convention? The way we find that out is by utilizing metrics on what we actually observe and see. Right now, by utilizing an app on a phone, a tablet, any other mobile device, we're able to see where you go within an exhibit hall. We're able to track your spaces, where you stop, what you look at, and we're able to do this now in real time. This was never possible beforehand. We always need to use the model and rely on virtual models. Not anymore. We're reality. None of this is virtual. We like looking at what actually is and how we can impact what is happening at the time. So this is not the future. This is like the norm. No, this is now. We are doing this now. The future is going to be when you're not going to need to have an application. We're going to be able to tell you're walking by there completely passively. We're going to be able to model convention halls without ever having going there or taking any extra information. For the hosts of the convention, how would you like to really know where your investment is going and that you are absolutely maximizing your investment and getting the returns out of it that you need, that the people that you are bringing to your convention are getting real information out of it and are going to want to re-attend? The vendor. The vendors, possibly the biggest impact there is. How do you drive people to your convention? How do you drive them to your group? What is attracting people right now? If you have the message, but you don't have the means of delivering it effectively, you're obviously not going to be getting everything you put out of it. This is going to help you maximize your effort. Convention goer. To the convention goers, all I can say is hold on to your hats. I've seen things in the last six months that have made ordinary conventions look like nothing. I have seen virtual representations in a physical space, and I have actually gone to a recent convention where everyone was wearing headphones within a room and listening and walking around for it, and yet no one was talking to each other. Everyone was talking to people on the other side of the country. We're in the, we're, we're a type of experience that we could never have imagined. Is this the part of the interview where you just dematerialize and we find out you're a cyber person? I tell you to beam me up, but quite frankly, it just doesn't work yet. In the end, this is not a war against technology. The ever-present screen 
is not the all-encompassing enemy. Instead, we must look at the deluge of technology as a good thing, harnessing these tools in new and innovative ways, engaging all of the senses, deploying innovative storytelling, leveraging available technology to reach a wider audience, and utilizing verifiable intelligence to help inform how and where you present information in order to provide the best outcomes for all involved. We live in an age where everything anyone wants to know about virtually anything is available by peering into the all-consuming blue-green glow of technology. Fear and conventional thought has told us this is a bad thing. But for those of us who choose to embrace the flood, funnel it, control it, and use it for our purposes, this is the age we have been waiting for. I'm <laughs> sorry.